You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lindsay Fay. Go to HankGarner.com. You can find archives of all the shows and you can subscribe there so you never miss an episode. I want to thank our sponsors today who make this show possible. And not only do they make the show possible, but they are doing amazing things. I want you to go visit M.G. Heron and check out his brand new book called The Translocator. You can find it at mgheron.com slash ASP, ASP for Author Stories Podcast. A revolutionary quantum teleportation device promises to bring humanity one step closer to the stars until it fails spectacularly. Archaeologist Eliana Fisk is ripped from Earth while the whole world watches. She lands on a strange new world inhabited by a lost tribe of ancient Mayans. Meeting them, getting first-hand exposure to age-old customs and rituals, it seems like an archaeologist's dream. But what if the rituals have a darker meaning? What if the god these people pray to is no god at all? And how in the world will she ever get back home? Thus begins a pulse-pounding race against time that hurls Eliana into the great unknown, revealing ancient technologies and marvelous mysteries more outlandish than she ever imagined. The Translocator is an action-packed sci-fi thriller perfect for fans of Stargate, the Atlantis Gene, and other archaeology-inspired science fiction adventures. mgheron.com slash ASP. I'd also like to tell you about Robert Cruz's series, Saga of the Iron Dragon. Uh, the first book, The Dream of the Iron Dragon, oh, just blew my mind away. I, I, I love this book so much. The 23rd century humanity uh, has been hunted to the verge of extinction by uh, an alien race. Trapped 1,300 years in the past, they have one mission, survive. Space travel, Vikings, time travel. The first book is out. The second book is out. The audiobook releases in just a day or two when you're hearing this. And then the third book is out in ebook and paperback uh, also later this week. I love the series so much. I think you guys are too. The Dream of the Iron Dragon, uh, Dawn of the Iron Dragon, and now book three, The Voyage of the Iron Dragon. There's a link to it in the show notes. Robert Cruzy, Saga of the Iron Dragon. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Lindsay Fay on the show with me today. She has a fantastic, phenomenal new book called The Paragon Hotel, and it is on sale everywhere now uh, when you're hearing this show. Welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. I'm excited to have you. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my God. So these are two separate questions, though. Writer or storyteller? So my first my first memory of wanting to be a storyteller was reading C.S. Lewis, and I loved the Chronicles of Narnia, and I wanted to tell the story, so I decided to direct a play, and I took my three years younger baby brother and I put him in his cute khakis and then I glued cotton balls all over his chest of course you so he could be Mr. Tumnus the Fawn um, and it turns out that that the sort of glue I was using doesn't come off all that easily <laughs> so uh, so my parents they didn't punish me they they were just laughing the entire time they were trying to get the cotton balls off of my baby brother's chest, but they were like, you need to ask us before you do this again. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's the first time I wanted to be a storyteller. The first time I wanted to be a writer is a completely different story. That was when I had read about the 65th incarnation of Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper. And I'm an obsessive Sherlockian. Like I just, I've been reading the Sherlock Holmes mysteries over and over again since I was a child nonstop. And uh, and I, I read one that just, I threw it sort of on the ground. I was so frustrated. And then I said to myself, you know what, Lindsay? 
if you can't do it yourself, you shouldn't be frustrated at other people. So then I wrote my first novel, which was called Dust and Shadow. And that is about Sherlock Holmes solving the Jack the Ripper the Jack the Ripper murders, excuse me, um, but including all of the research into the actual Jack the Ripper murders I that I could find. And I consulted with Scotland Yard detectives and with like ripperologists and experts because what was frustrating me was that it kept being Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper plus space aliens or like, you know, <laughs> plus the royal family right. or like plus vampires. And I was like, what if it wasn't plus anything? What if it was just scary? Because Jack the Ripper was murdering people. Right. And so right. then, yeah. That, yeah. That's the first time I realized that I wanted to be a writer, I guess. So in your mind, the story was enough if if it was told correctly. You didn't need all that other stuff if you could get to the heart of what the story was. I wanted the real pared-down story. I wanted what actually happened. I wanted the Caleb Carr version of Sherlock Holmes solving the Jack the Ripper murders, and it didn't exist. I didn't need the kitchen sink to be thrown into it. I didn't need plus the royal family, plus Transylvanian occultists, and I promise you this is actually important. Like, I didn't, I didn't need any of that window dressing. What I wanted was, also as a feminist, you know, I wanted, this was horrifying because this person was targeting really vulnerable people because they were in a really vulnerable industry. And Sherlock Holmes was a gentleman, and he wouldn't attract with that in any way. Right. And so I wanted to write about it. Well, um, you know, I asked that question at the beginning because I have this theory uh, that storytellers are born. That there's just a gene in there. There's they're born there's, gluing cotton balls yeah, to their little brothers. They chest. are, they are, and I didn't even have a little <laughs> brother, but I was doing it in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, and but you know, there's there's something about taking that step um, to write those stories. And mm -hmm. um, as someone who had never published before, had never written a book, um, you know, that's a that's kind of a big undertaking to kind of set the record straight on Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper. And well, it, I didn't expect it ever to be published. Uh, this I mean, was just for you. have to you. understand, I, I, just, I just wrote it for me. I mean, I didn't write it for people to read it. I wrote it because I wanted it to exist, and I had never read it. So I thought, okay, if, I, if I've never read it and I just need it, then I'll write it. And, like, maybe some Sherlockian small press will, like, publish it online eventually, like, in 10 years after I've convinced them to do it. I never expected it to get a book deal with Simon & Schuster. Like, that was, like, still feels like being struck by lightning. Sure. I can't believe I'm sitting here talking to you about my imaginary friends. I love that so I really much. can't. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, so because everyone does personal research with Scotland Yard and 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 mm -hmm. all, and all of that, that just made perfect sense to you to to settle this in your mind as, as a personal project. I I needed it to be what really happened versus how would Sherlock Holmes interact with what actually happened as opposed to how would Sherlock Holmes interact with Jack the Ripper plus right. tentacles. <laughs> right. And I was like, I don't need as many tentacles in this. Like I get it. Yeah. I just right. don't I just don't need it. Right, right. <laughs> I'm playing to my own taste. I, I was what I was doing is I was I've only ever written books that I thought to myself, I'd really like to read that, and then they don't exist, and then if they don't exist, then I think, well, maybe other people would like to read them too. So, well, I, I fear that too many writers uh, get caught up in in the um, trying to write to market, and, and not that there's anything wrong with writing to market and understanding what's popular. Mm -hmm. I, I get all that, um, but you know, it really does need to come from a passionate place if you want people to be as passionate about reading it um, as you are writing it. Well, look, there's a difference between, I'm sorry, I really didn't just mean to say, well, look to you. <laughs> <laughs> so disrespectful, I apologize. No, no. I, 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 meant, I meant to the, the audience. Right. <laughs> um, there's a difference between writing to market and writing to passion. If your passion is teenage vampires and that is all you're thinking about, and you just need more of them, but you're going to do teenage vampires in like a different way, write that because that is all you're thinking about. But don't write it because you think that it's going to sell. Because if you're writing something that you just think is going to sell, then 
you're not really writing it by putting your heart and like shellacking it on the page, which is something that I can honestly say for all of my books. Like you take a little piece of yourself and you take a, a brick trowel, and you sort of scrape it onto the page because it is really difficult to write books in a way that is personal and you know, you're investing not only a part of your time, but a part of yourself in this book. And so if yourself wants to be manifested as teen vampires, then do that for the love of God, please, because I'm not going to be the person to tell you don't do teen vampires, but I will be the person to tell you don't do teen vampires because you think you're going to make money when you don't really like them. Right. Because that's not writing a book. That's trying to make money. Yeah. And it's not the same thing. Well, and, and often it, it reeks of, of that. It's you, Mm -hmm. and some of them are very entertaining and, but you pick them up, you read them once and you move on to something else. You never think about that book again. When when you can, when you can tell that this was the author's passion, those are usually the books that Mm -hmm. you return to as a reader and, Mm -hmm. and, and glean something every time you read it. Well, My last novel was called Jane Steele, and it was a sort of satirical riff off of Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre was a book that Charlotte Bronte needed to write. Right. She needed to write it because her sister died in that school, and she needed to sit down and write that novel where she, you know, goes through all of those things and then has a totally romantic, ridiculous affair with a stupidly rich man. Like you And do. everything has a, at like you do, and everything has a happy ending. She needed to write that book. And you can tell that she needed to write it because people still read it now. Right. And that's not a new book. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. but, it's so full, but it's so full of genuine feeling. And you can tell. You can just tell. And right. it's wonderful. So how long did it take you to uh, to write Dust and Shadow? My first one, God, it yeah. uh, took, about, took about 10 months. Took okay. five months of research. Um, mm, yeah, it took about five months of research. Um, and then it took about five months of really intensive writing because uh, – <laughs> Because I was fortunate enough to have been laid off of my job. Uh, And I was making unemployment, which is not large. And I turned to my husband and I said, "Uh, I want to finish this book. And he was like, yeah, you should do that. And then um, I went to my former employers and they said, we're opening a new place. And I was like, I think I need to finish this book. And I said, Oh, never mind. We didn't say anything. Go do that. And my parents were like, oh, yeah, finish the book. Go do that. And you know what was the shock, The most shocking thing for me during the whole experience was that no one ever laughed at me a single time. And so I really make it a habit of mine and, and not just a habit, like an, an ethos because um, I do a lot of mentorship. That whenever anybody says to me, you know what I'm going to do? I say, yeah, you should absolutely do that. Yeah. Because you can. Yeah. Because it's a ridiculous thing to say to somebody, you know what? I had this job. I'm going to write a mystery novel. Like that sounds really silly. No. Nobody treated it like it was silly. Well, and if you find out that they have bona fides like, uh, you know, creating a, a Mr. Tumnus out of their little brother, then then you have to encourage those people. <laughs> That's not on my CV, though. Right. So, like, people didn't necessarily know that. <laughs> like, it's not it's not at the top of my CV. I'll put it I'll put it that way. Like, it's it's toward the like bottom third. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your new book, The Paragon Hotel, is this your sixth book? It's my sixth book and my no. Well, it's my seventh book. It's my sixth novel. Okay. Um, last year, I had my first short story collection actually come out, which was crazy. But yes, this is my sixth novel. That is fantastic. Absolutely. 
the the book is uh is is crazy good um it's thank you you looking back over your catalog you you have a love it appears of of historical fiction and mm-hmm. taking some of these stories that have been told and digging deeper and and telling maybe a different take on it um what what is it about the Paragon Hotel in this setting that uh that grabbed your attention I understand being a, a dedicated Sherlockian and, and where the first book came from, um, but where mm-hmm. did where did the idea for this one start percolating? Well, I was born in San Jose, California, but I grew up uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon, okay. um, and <laughs> uh, in a town called Longview, Washington. And uh, we moved there when I was around six years old, and I sort of famously said to my mom when we got there where are all the tan people? Because I didn't understand. It's very racially diverse (laughs) in San Jose. Right. It's really not out in Oregon. Uh, And I asked her that specifically and she said, I don't, I don't, sweetheart, I don't know. And she didn't understand either. I mean, my godmother is African American. So none of us understood it. And then I'm six and I sit down in, um, in a church pew at vacation Bible school of all things. Uh, and I've got a really healthy San Jose tan, like, and, and we have, and we have a little bit of, um, of native American Ute tribe just back in the day. But like, uh, when I was born, you couldn't tell my pupils from my eyeballs. So I get tan real easy and I'm sitting there in the pew. I'm six and this kid turns, looks at me as I sit down and says, Ew, I don't want to sit next to a Japanese girl. What? Which on a lot of levels is so fascinating. Right. Because because even when I was six, I understood the irony of all of this. (laughs) I was like, okay, one of all, I'm not Japanese. Two of all, if I were Japanese, it sounds like my life would be a little rough right now. (laughs) Right. And three of all. Like, what are you talking about? We're at vacation Bible school. So uh, I learned about the racism that is inherent in the Pacific Northwest when I was very, very young because we had come from as far away as exotic California and because I tan easily. So it's very strange to be talking about racism as a person of not color. But I've seen what it looks like, and I, you know, I haven't suffered it. I've seen what it looks like, though, and I'm like, weird. So I didn't know what was going on for the longest time. My husband and I, um, we went to school in the Bay Area in California. It was wonderful there. We, um, We moved to New York City in 2005. We bought a house in Queens. We love it here. Um, it's fantastic. Eventually I, I started reading articles when I started after I had written a good amount of historical fiction, started reading some articles about, um, how Oregon was actually founded as a racist utopia, like just an all white utopia. And I didn't understand up until that moment what had really been going on when I was a kid. And it was almost a eureka moment for me as an adult to be reading these articles about how, no, Oregon was founded as we're not going to have any people of color here and we're going to have no crime and it's going to be great. So Oregon is actually the only state in the entire union to have put a no black people clause in their state constitution. Wow. The only state in the union. Wow. Prior, prior to that being in their constitution in 1844, the previous um, <laughs> policy was that if black people stayed in the state for longer than six months, they should be whipped every six months until they leave. So that oh was the other policy. Oh, my and then, goodness. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Uh, super good ideas for law right. enforcement. Well, and, and the good the, thing is there's then, never been any crime there. Yeah, never yeah. once right. in Oregon has there right. been a crime. Exactly. Um, until black people got there. <laughs> uh, 
I just hate all of this so much. Right. It makes me like itchy. And then, um, so in 1870, right, black people are granted the right to vote following the Civil War. Uh, Oregon was one of five states to not ratify that amendment, but they fixed it super quick in 1959. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it just gets worse and worse Yeah, because they keep doubling down on it. And you would think that this is ridiculous, but you can see it when you're actually in the Pacific Northwest. You can see how wide it is. You And to me, just growing up in San Jose, landing there, going back to the Bay Area, and then moving to New York City, it was always really weird to me. And like the Paragon Hotel is in no way just about a race. It's not about race at all on a lot of levels. Right. Um, and you know, on a lot of levels, it's about female friendship and it's about honesty and it's about learning to love yourself and finding out who you are. And it's about all these other things. And there are jokes and there are, you know, pretty dresses. It's not just about race, but like, yeah, what brought me to it was just this really weird childhood experience of having moved there and being like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, and now that I'm an adult, I, I kind of do because I've done the research. Right. Well, as being someone that is from Mississippi, uh, like I am, uh, racism is something that is uh, the forefront of lots of conversations, lots of mm-hmm. uh, lots of literature that comes from here. Like our experience is, is rooted uh, in that. And even in, mm-hmm. we're in 2019 now and. And we feel that we have made uh, strides in in every area, and that the, the the place we live is is a much better place than it's ever been. There are still I'm reminders, sure it is. yeah, and, and there are still reminders. Um, but you know the 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 weird thing about it is is our experience has been very upfront and very public, and you you yeah, don't really I, think of I that. Just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, may, may, I, may I just point out that like I think that you do make strides against something terrible if you are confronting it head on as opposed to if it's just this open secret nobody talks about right if it's the elephant in the the room and nobody's talking about it you're not going to change anything right it's just going to sit there sure sorry go on no no i was just going to say that that, i really think that that's the situation that oregon is sort of in where it's like we're just never going to talk about it is that cool cool like let's just all be white (laughs) <laughs> right, which is so bizarre to me, and I'd never heard that story. That is that is amazing in in a crazy, crazy way. Um, but you know what? What really um, makes a difference is when we talk about these things and we couch them uh, in story, where totally. it's not where it's not just Lindsay saying, "People, this is crazy. No one should ever Mm-mm. behave this way." You know, that's, no one's going to listen to that. Nobody's going to listen. That's, and, and, it's and too have, preachy. And they have. And they have no reason to. Right. I wouldn't stop walking down the street in New York City if somebody were standing on a soapbox yelling about the fact that Oregon is the only state in the union ever to have had a no black clause in its constitution. I wouldn't pause in my stride in New York to listen to that person screaming at me. But if I were invested in a story about people whose lives were affected by it, then maybe I would, you know, I would take a second. So, so what happens is we find ourselves in 1921, uh, and we meet Alice, uh, Alice James, uh, the, the protagonist here. Um, where did Alice come to you and how did you inject her into the story in this, this crazy place? Well, I live in New York now and, um, I really wanted Alice to arrive in Portland in 1921, and I wanted her to be an ally for the African-American community because I really just refused to write books from an African-American point of view, like first person, because I don't feel like I have the right to do that. So if I come up with a historical person who it's reasonable to sort of interject her into the narrative, not in a savior way, but in an observer way, like this is what's happening, then I'm really interested in that sort of story. So uh, Alice came about because I, I love setting 
narratives and places that I have seen and smelled and absorbed and sort of taken in because it's so much more authentic. So uh, my husband and I used to live on 162nd Street and Alice grew up in Harlem and she grew up in historic Italian American Harlem um, when the mafia was just starting to put you know, its claws, sink its claws into absolutely everything to do with the Italian community in America. And um, I found that story fascinating, too. So when we meet Alice uh, in the first pages of the book, she is escaping Harlem, New York, with a bullet wound that's festering on a Pullman train. And she has an African-American a Poland porter named Max, who is kind to her because they talk about jazz together because they both love jazz. And I think that, you know, talking about music together, that is something that brings a lot of people together across all sorts of cultures. But anyway, she uh, she's fleeing the people who are very keen to murder her. Um, and that is in Harlem. And she ends up in Portland. And there are a lot of differences between battling the mafia and battling the KKK, but she finds herself very equipped to do both. And I wanted to come up with somebody who wasn't going to feel like a fish out of water landing in the only African-American hotel in Portland, Oregon, which is the Paragon Hotel. So she doesn't feel like a fish out of water at all because she grew up in Harlem. And so, you know, I just sort of I backtracked from there. Well, while not exactly a fish out of water, um, Alice is um, faced with being in a place where her ideas are not the norm. Um, yeah. How do you um, – how do you build an every an every man, every woman character like Alice and put her up against kind of insurmountable odds, but um, but give her the power to change? What a wonderful question. <laughs> Let me think about that. Oh, I, I, I well, OK. Um, she. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, a little she's broad. An, she, yeah, I'm sorry. She's she's this this great kind of every woman character that that oh, it, thank it, you. Yeah, yeah. okay yeah, that in and of herself uh, is it, she doesn't yeah. necessarily have the power to 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 uh, to bring about great monumental change, but she no, does. No, she doesn't. Uh, but she does by uh, by just her character and and her oh, interactions. You. So yeah, so no, how, I, how do I you, totally see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I think that I think that Alice has a quality um, that I admire very much in people, and um, that can also be a very difficult quality to have, in the sense that Alice is a good listener. Um, at the same time that she's a good observer of things going on, and I deliberately set out when I wrote the Paragon Hotel not to make her somebody who is the agent for massive change because. I didn't want it to be a white people to the rescue novel because I'm not in that business and that's not something that I'm interested in writing. But I was interested in writing something from the perspective of a person who is a very good observer and a very good listener because people like to tell her things. And that is something that I do have personal experience with. Um, I have I have walked up to grocery store clerks, you know, with a hunk of cheese and said, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? And then they have, you know, like stopped me for 10 minutes and told me their life story. And, um, and so I do understand what that feels like. And so does Timothy Wilde um, in my other trilogy because, you know, like – Listening to people, I think, is is something that, in and of itself, is a is a quality that lends itself to storytelling. Because if you were storytelling and you were only ever telling your own, then it wouldn't be very interesting, right? Would it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Lindsay, I, I, I'm so sorry we're out of time uh, today, but the, the Paragon Hotel is out everywhere now. Um, I love this book. I love what you're doing. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to find out more about you and your work, uh, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Sure. If they went to um, www.lindsayfay.com, and that's spelled eccentrically, so it's L-Y-N-D-S-A-Y. F-A-Y-E, lindsayfay.com, then they can find all of my things. And you can also use the Googles with that name, and it will take you to all of my stuff. Fantastic. Um, I recommend this book uh, highly to everyone. We're actually going to have an audiobook clip uh, right after the interview here. If you'll stay tuned, uh, you can hear a clip from the Paragon Hotel, which is on sale now everywhere. Uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It is absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me, and I hope to be back someday if I didn't talk your ear off. Absolutely. You're welcome back anytime. Uh, Have a great day, Lindsay. You too. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Visit us at hankgarner.com and find archives of all of the shows, and while you're there, please subscribe. Stay tuned now for a special audiobook clip from the audiobook narrated by January Lavoie, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. Sitting against the pillows of a Pullman sleeper, bones clacking like the pistons of the metal beast speeding me westward, I wonder if I'm going to die. The walls of my vibrating coffin are polished mahogany, windows spotless, reflecting onyx midnight presently. I've been watching them for several days. When I wasn't switching trains, which was its own jostling hell and doesn't bear repeating. Does Salt Lake City ever bear repeating, really? I don't even suppose I took the fastest route cross-country, so long as I was always moving. I remember fleeing New York, still adrift with the shock battling sucking currents of lost love and lost city dragging me under. Changing at Chicago, I remember. The hustle, the weight of all that metal, the sheer rank sweat of making the connection. I recall prim forests, sloping hills, downy wheat tufts, crops we tore through like an iron bomb and desolate empty skies. Big bergs, shabby shacks, towns undeserving of the word, all blurring into America. But at night it's been the black window, the white alcove curtain, smells of cigarettes and pot roast and cold cream, and the fever slick coating my brow confirming that I'm going to die. I'm in shock, possibly. Despair, certainly. Now it hits me in a crack of panic that I'd prefer death drop by when I'm 90 and not 25, supposing it's all the same to the Harding administration. Panting, I tug at my hair. The sudden flare momentarily douses the fire in other locales. I wonder when my bunkmate will return to torment me. I wouldn't have taken a sleeping car if I hadn't been forced. Acquaintances are dangerous. They pour over your mug out of sheer boredom, make remarks like, God, isn't our porter just dreadful? These sheets are barely tucked in. They don't give a knotted cherry stem what you think of the porter. They can't really see him anyhow. No, they hanker to watch you react to them. Then they can journal it, whether you're haughty or humble or hateful. Whether you're all right. Whether you're not all right, which is ever so much more interesting. Dangerous, what with death and dismemberment potentially in hot pursuit. I couldn't go full-scale deluxe, though. A private car would have been checked first by someone searching this train. Any cadet axe man would chart the same course. Private cars, sleeping cars, then public seating. Maybe I ought to lend a hand to the brakeman, trade a few dirty jokes in exchange for a hiding place. If only I could dangle from the undercarriage like a bat. The bullet wound deposited in Harlem started reaping interest in Chicago, and now we're well past Walla Walla, and it's aiming to make me a swell payout. Last time I staggered to the facilities, it looked like a volcano had erupted, crusted reds and blacks. Now it's eating me alive. 
I can't sit up in a public car. Has to be a sleeper. Has to be this one. I leaped on this connecting train in Denver like an outlaw onto the town's last nag. My heart isn't beating. It's clenching its fist at me. Clamp clinch, clutch grip. Beastly. Tears keep welling up and my throat keeps closing and no, I say. You're called nobody for a reason. Just be yourself. Be nobody. Be nobody and breathe. Having died before, I ought to be more sanguine over the prospect. I first died six days ago at the murder stable when Officer Harry Chipchase hustled me out of that gruesome dungeon, snapping, Run, kid! But I, damn it, nobody hitch a ride to the moon. You're dead to this town now, you hear? Harry was always dour, but I'd never seen his face turn the color of molding cheese previous. I swear to you I'll find a body somewhere. trust me, kid. You died today. Now run.